It is 3 o'clock, and as I learned from Chairman Richard Smith this morning, let's always get started on time. Appreciate everyone being here on this super busy uh, committee day that we've had. I'd like to call on Representative Larica, who would say a blessing to get us started. All right, if y'all don't mind, join me with, in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the special guests that are with us today, especially the Senate Rules Chairman and and friends, we thank you for this committee and all that we do. Help us to make good decisions for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Our posture in this, we've got four House bills we're going to be hearing only, and I've got three Senate bills we're going to be moving, taking action on. First one, of course, my good neighbor, Chairman Gooch. I'm going to call on the rules, Chairman, first, if you don't mind. <laughs> They're, they are. <laughs> the, the walking quorum. The uh, walking quorum. Well, I, pre I, well, I appreciate you. You know that very well. Mr. Chairman, which one would you like to talk about first? I'm finding you. There you go. I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and distinguished members of this audacious committee. Or audacious? I think that's wrong. Anyway, thank you for having me today. Counselor, good to see you as well. Which bill are we talking about? If you want to do... Uh, 1027 first that's your joint music economic, ah, and, and and i know how much you love music well and i play a radio very well and that's about a, that's a joke you know play the uh, radio <laughs> see they all have bills too in the committee. well uh, as you know this is the year of georgia music and uh, there we need to see what we can do i think to incentivize the music industry so that Georgia becomes the next Tennessee or the Nashville, uh, where um, our purpose is to find the right temperament so that we can have concerts start here and their recording industry develop here. And then I mean a diverse recording industry that c recovers all genres of music. And I think Atlanta's the place to be, and Georgia's the place to be. So this is just a study committee that has uh, a joint study committee for the House and the Senate to work together with the industry to find the right temperament for a study committee to find the right incentives to make sure that Georgia's their place. And we think it's the most outstanding study committee I've seen yet this year, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. <Ms>. Chairman. <laughs> I think there's going to be a race to see. But I just got one uh, Sure, and, and let me thank you for all your help in putting this... Uh, bettered together in your uh, committee substitute too. Well, thank you. And we'll pass this as a substitute just to make people aware. But one thing I want to make sure that that's been made aware to me, Mr. Chairman, is th the tax implications. You know, similar to what we've done with film, do y'all anticipate looking at something like that for music to really create the explosion we've had in film? Absolutely. Now, we, again, we got to hit the right medium. We don't want to be too too far. We, you know, because we're dealing with the uh, tax dollars. But if we didn't have this incentive, we wouldn't have the, I don't believe we'll have the growth that we did in the movie industry that has been very profitable, especially in local communities in which movies are made. I know they're looking at Dominique right now for the right face on some Ooh. picture Ooh. That in the movie industry. Ooh, I can vision that now. Yeah. Do any of the committee members have a question, Chairman Mullis? Oh, okay. Uh, Go ahead. Um, one of the things that some friends and I have talked about, and uh, and I say this seriously, and even in our movie industry that you have mentioned, some of what the fear is is that the uh, the movie industry will bring with it some of the challenges of the that Hollywood or California has, and I think uh, when you bring all genres of music, you possibly are at some risk to bring some folks that maybe don't think like the average people in Georgia think like. And I, I would encourage this study committee to maybe try to somehow evaluate and incorporate into that the risks that come with attracting a lot of different types of... And, and thank you for that, Representative. And I know what you're saying, but you'd be surprised already of the, the artists that live in Georgia. I mean, you would be shocked to know who lives here. For example... The group Kansas, 
They, they don't live in Kansas. They live in, in Georgia. Leonard Skinner, who's from Florida, they live in Georgia. I mean, there's so many that live here. We just don't know. And instead of going to Nashville, they'd rather record right here. So let's incentivize them. And it'd be more chance for my dear wife to see Luke Bryan. She loves him. <laughs> Indeed. He doesn't need to go to Nashville. He needs to do it here in Atlanta. So I'd love to entertain a motion from the committee. Got a second? Thank All you. in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? I hear none. That one moves on. Thank you. Is that all I have with you? Or do no, sir. Okay. You have another one. All right. That's been highly, I mean, much talked about in the halls. Of our, and this, if you look at folks, it's uh, SR 1038 in your file. It's the Joint Alternative Fuels Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as you know, uh, as we're trying to, to be uh, fuel efficient in this country and not dependent on foreign oil, well, we found that alternative fuel sources like LP, uh, that is uh, American uh, developed, would be uh, something we need to look at. And infrastructures for that, for example, uh, heavy trucks on the road are now trying to use LP. In fact, uh, UPS, or, uh, Frank, are you here? UPS trucks, they're just expanding their fleet and they've paid $70,000 more for a vehicle on top of the normal price to use LP fuel. And the, the uh, fueling stations are not adequate currently, just like when gasoline was produced back in the early 1900s. So we're trying to find a way to incentivize the creation of fueling stations along the, the highways and byways to help find alternative fueling sources for our big fleets in Georgia. That's basically what we're talking about. Can the members of the committee have any questions? Right here, 13. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. um, I'm from southern Georgia, and we have a lot of farmland. Um, a lot of these fueling stations are in the metro areas yes. that I've noticed. Um, are you all going to visit the uh, possible opportunity for um, possible fueling stations in southern Georgia where we have so much land we need to. that we could use as solar farms? Absolutely. Well, uh, ours is mainly the infrastructure for fueling sources for vehicles. However, you know, I, I, I don't care how we expand this, whatever's best for the people of Georgia or our commerce in Georgia. And rural Georgia is where things should happen. And, for example, we have one fueling station developing in Ringo, Georgia, in my area, and also representing Weldon's. This kind of inspired me to help mm -hmm. create such a thing. Not knowing what to do, you know, we create a study committee and bring the industry in and also find members of the House and Senate to work on this issue is my vision. Thank you. Sir. Representative Lariki. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this the uh, like the CNG co compressed natural gas or yes. is that that's the same thing? Yes, uh, all the above and it has nothing to do with any pipelines by the right, way. Right, right, right. Well, our, our uh, waste <laughs> management and some of our uh, the city Not of that I'm against Coffee pipeline, County. but, you know. They, uh, they have purchased some uh, some waste management trucks that are utilizing the uh, exactly. uh, compressed natural gas station that we have. And so uh, I was just making sure compressed natural gas was the same as LP. That's I get all I'm that confused. To, yeah. I use LP. It's a little widely known. But that's exactly what we're talking about. And local fleets may have that local station, but what about the r trucks on the road? We have to figure out how to uh, find them some fuel sources, too. But any other committee members have a question for the chairman? Entertain a motion on on 10:38. It's up. He made a motion. To Got a second. Those in favor? Aye. Any other opposed? Thank, Thank you, you, ladies chairman. and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman. And if, if I can be of service in my little old committee, please let me know. Mr. Chairman, I do have a question? Yes. Who have you designated oh. to carry either of these bills, or do you have a you know, I don't. I have volunteers. I, Ms. Rakesbell was just excited about your Whoever music. can pass this bill for me, I'd love for them to host it, and okay. I'd be grateful. I'll take her care of it this time. Okay. I'll leave that up to you, Mr. Chair. All right. Well, thank you. I'll take and care let of me it. know who that is. I okay? will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Have a great afternoon. All righty. Committee, our next Senate resolution is, where are we at? We'll see. Um, Senator Gooch, 
a good neighbor, my senator from the beautiful Georgia mountains. How you doing? We're doing great. Thank this you for being here with us this a, afternoon. I think this is a bill that a lot of your rural members have asked about and talked to me about. It creates a joint study committee for rural broadband across Georgia. Opportunities for uh, small communities to expand their broadband capabilities and bandwidth. You know, in the in the business that Senator Mullis and I are in, economic development, used to you had to have water and sewer and gas to attract industry. Today, if you don't have good broadband and proper bandwidth, you're in trouble. So we think we have opportunities around the state. We can we can do some good things with our private sector partners. And so this this is what this is going to do. It allows for 10 members to be appointed, five by the speaker, five by the lieutenant governor. We'll meet five days somewhere in Georgia and come back at the end of the year with a good report, make some recommendations on how we can help the industry. That's pretty much all I have. I know, Mr. Chairman, that's the, um, or Mr. Whip, excuse me, that it's a, uh, I just did a bill in Senate on uh, e-filing of plats, and one big consideration came up was um, just the lack of internet access across many parts of our state to send a big file it's, like a plat it's a, would it's be. It's a problem in some areas today. It'll be worse if we don't do something. Have, have the, any, of our, any of our committee members have a question? Pardon me, yes ma'am? Go ahead. Okay, thank you, um, Senator, for bringing this bill because it is much needed, um, not only in rural Georgia, but in some places around here that are still liking the um, capabilities of good broadband internet access. So thank you for bringing this thank um, you. study committee. You're welcome. Thank you, ma'am. And one of the good things, committee members, you'll get to, you're the first ones to know about these, and when that letter goes out to volunteer for some of these study committees, you'll know about them and you know really what they're about. And uh, this will be a great one. It's up to the committee. I'd like to have a motion. Make a motion. We got a motion to do pass. A second. Second. Any of all those in favor? Bye. Aye. Aye. And opposed? Thank you, Senator Gooch. Yes, sir. Thank you. Appreciate you. Next, we're moving on to, to some hearings. We're listening to first, we're going to listen to Rep. Chairman Martin on 10 6 or 1605. Excuse me, you'll find there. I think it's one we all need to listen carefully, and uh, that really affects a lot of us. And thank you for being here, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if it, it pleases the committee, I'm dealing off LC 391379, House Resolution 1605. Uh, bring this to you today, uh, along with uh, Pro Tem Jan Jones, uh, Representative Brockway, Chairman Willard, Ed Setzler, and others. Um, this seeks to create a uh, companion house study committee. Um, I guess Senator Gooch had to leave. He, he did mention he was uh, the, the quorum in Senate Finance, but Senator Gooch has sponsored a, a companion uh, resolution, uh, Senate Resolution 1085, that we, we wish to study uh, the options for a regional transportation solution. We all know we have heard um, out of the Senate conversations around the MARTA expansion. Um, with uh, two Senate bills, I think 13, 313 and 330. What we seek to do in this resolution in, uh, in working with the Senate is to look at uh, uh, what is needed to do a demand study, to find out where people need to go rather than come up with a solution uh, prior to that says a line shall go here and one here and one here. But uh, instead, we'd like to look at where um, people in the, in the region need to travel and look at all different modalities, not just a train, not just a bus, but maybe a combination of those, maybe a, a combination of, of service streets and geometric reconfigurations of intersections to allow people to get there uh, so that we can really reach out in this region and, and make a, Atlanta uh, a planned place to, to go in the future without a preconceived determination that that solution is MARTA or isn't MARTA or is Greta or is a combination of all three. Uh, to best deploy capital because this, this money that we take from taxpayers is hard for them to come by and if we take it we need to look at the most fiscally responsible way. Um, be glad to answer your, your committee's questions Mr. Chairman. Um, the, the outline of the committee is on page two. Uh, it seeks to, to allow the speaker uh, to appoint the membership to the committee. I believe there are seven, seven members limited to five days. Could meet more than five days but only five days would be compensated. Um, stand to answer any questions. Mr. Chairman, do you, I guess, do you stand to bring um, 
the experts in the field to this meeting. I think it, this is one of those that can be these all day meetings. Yeah, yes, sir. And, and again, I'm, besides the tearing up the chair's uh, equipment over here, um, I, I don't want to take too much time, but you're right. I mean, what we want to do with this and, and talking with Senator Gooch and, and our, our colleagues across the, the hall is we don't want to have a preconceived notion. We don't want to come in and say we have a solution. We want to look to people that don't have a vested interest. Quite frankly, and with due respect to Marta and Mr. Parker, I, I understand they're doing a, a great job right now, and due respect to Greta, and they're doing a great job right now. People that are getting the tax money to spend have, by definition, a vested interest in making the solution that they can deploy the right solution so the money comes to them. We want to have experts from the field from all over the country. We want to look in, in Los Angeles where actually ridership on their transit system has gone down 3% year over year. We want to look at what they did right, what maybe they did wrong, and what we can get better at in the Atlanta region rather than coming up with a preconceived solution. So, yes, uh, you mentioned that some of your members are about volunteering for a study committee. I would say if you volunteer for this one, bring your lunch. We might be there all day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's questions from the committee. Representative Turner, are you 11? Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Martin, for bringing the bill, uh, the resolution. I do have uh, just one seed I'd like to plant with you as sure. you um, in undergo this endeavor as you study uh, some of our transit issues is taking into account the density population-wise of the city of Atlanta and the metro region in, in formulating some of your solutions. Because it's my understanding that of the 500 most dense population centers in the world, Atlanta comes in at 499. And so <clears throat> in order for things like rail to work, I would just would encourage the, the, your study committee as you go through your work to keep that, that fact in mind that density plays a role in the viability of mass transit options and in order for any mass transit option to be able to self-sustain over a long period of time that has to population center and growth and where people actually live and where they go to work has to be part of that equation and i, I know that you will but i just wanted to plant that seed with you now yeah yes sir and if i might mr chairman just a brief follow-up I, I would even say this is a regional transit it doesn't necessarily say mass transit this this transit may be small bus transit it may be van transit it may be um, BRT in some areas, it may be express buses in some areas. I, I don't, what, what I would prefer, my opinion is, is for us to go into this without a preconceived notion. The only, you know, preconceived notion I would want to have is that we want to be fiscally responsible in the deployment. Certainly a transit system is not going to make money day one. In fact, most transit systems, you know, operate over time at a loss because of the greater good they bring. But it, that does not mean that we should not look to fiscally deploy the capital in the most advantageous advantageous way uh, to support all the users and really look at moving people from where they are to where they need to be and, and just lastly with that mr. chairman I'd say the, the first thing we would to do is you've heard uh, I think referred to heat maps um, that I think the Braves did that when they moved to Cobb County they said here's where we want to be here's where our, our users come from I think it's perfectly fair to look at, at businesses that are along the current MARTA line or, or maybe a projected line where and, and when I say line I don't necessarily mean a train it could be a BRT but look where the, the businesses are up there and then do a map of the zips where people currently work and see where they come from because if 60 percent of the people come from the north and we're building rapid transit to the south that's not going to do those 60 percent any good we need to look at where they're doing and I think you you raise a great point so we don't even need to be preconceived that it is a mass transit it's just transit to move people because just like people don't care what the fire what color the fire truck is that you know they just want it there I don't think people care what kind or, or what label is on the mode of transportation they just want to get there in an economically friendly manner thank you representative Turner representative Larica uh, thank you mr. chairman have you uh, received any of the hundreds of emails from a mr. Rick Fretwell about transportation <laughs> because I would suggest reaching out to that guy right he can tell you how to fix the transportation issues in Georgia I, I'm not familiar with the gentleman I just pulled up the <laughs> yeah I just I just pulled up the latest email from mr. Fretwell and I've spoken with him in length on the phone just because I like to have those conversations and this email is if it were printed out on paper it'd be 20 pages long and uh, so Mr. Fretwell can probably help you. We'll, 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 I'll get with you, Representative, and we'll make sure if I'm involved in this that, all, all joking aside, that if he, if he has something to bring, we, we want to hear it. 
It appears that he does. I believe, Mr. Chairman, that he will be at one of your meetings. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Representative Dukes. Pay attention. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank I'm you, the wrong Mr. person. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative Martin, for bringing this legislation. One of the things that I have a as a concern is that you, you answer one of the question because you're talking about all forms of transit, not just rail, but the entire scope. Is this bill? Is is your study committee going to take into consideration the funding element when it comes to finding out where? Uh, the transit needs are and the type transit. We all take in consideration the funding mechanism as to how we're going to get to where the committee can is. Representative, I, I thank you for the question. I, I was going to actually address that in closing, but I, I thank you for bringing it up. I, I would I would say this. I think first we look at the needs and, and where they are, and then we look at first if we need additional funding. Now, most of us sitting here, knowing where the, the funding is, we, we would venture a guess that certainly we need additional funding but I think even going into the study saying you know how much can we get for a half a penny or how much can we get for a penny is the wrong way to do it we first need to find out what needs to be there when we can deliver it you know how, how fast and how economical we could de uh, deliver it and then we need to be upfront and honest one of the best things that, that worked I think in, in this state is the East Bloss because our boards of education put a project list together. They tell people what they're going to get, that they're going to pay the tax for five years. They go and build it. And if they need to do more, they come back and they've done what they said they were going to do. I think we need to be in, in the transit world. Might have to be a little bit longer term because these projects are larger and, and more expensive. But I think we need to set forth a list, tell people what we're going to do, do it and um, before we ask them for more money. So uh, ab absolutely, I, I think that's part of the plan. But I, again, my, my opinion would be that we would not go in with a preset, look, we can do a half penny or a penny or three quarters of a penny, let's go see what we can do. First, we need to find out what needs to be done to service the region and then go find out, make a case to the voters that you know we're going to do this in, in pieces to deliver for them and you know if we do that they will trust us if we fail to do that they will not and they have every right to, to go in, in either case but I appreciate the question thank you mr. chairman one question I have chairman Martin is you know the, the ARC and have they done long-range studies also would that be you know possibility of great information from you how does I'm, I'm sure, you know, I, years ago I served um, for six years on the Atlanta Regional Commission, and they, they do studies. They tend to do them, you know, in the medium and long term, and, and those are certainly things I think we would want to take into consideration. But I think, f again, my opinion, that's why there will be seven people and seven from the Senate, you know, if, if I'm, a, you know, appointed to serve. But my opinion would be we also need to look at, at short and medium term. I think it's, it's, it's really unfair to look to voters to, to pay whether it be a quarter penny, half penny, or penny for solutions that are going to uh, drop into place 12 or 15 or 20 years from now, but they pay for it now. I think people are suffering in congestion in, in, in certain areas. Uh, it may not be congestion, but just uh, transit options that aren't available today. I think we have to look at short, medium, and long term and develop a funding formula so that, that people are not overtaxed, people are not paying too much up front but people see a value and move forward. But certainly I think ARC will be part of that. I think um, the, the um, federal highway, see, see even though there's, there's a transit system, again, if it doesn't stay interconnected, much like intermodal is for tr transporting from down at the port through the rail, through, through trucking, you know, one of those is no good without the, you know, without the entire plan. I think the same thing, in, in my opinion, uh, with transit if you can't get to the station you can't ride the transit we have a we have a difficulty we have to realize that in with our MARTA system there can never be an express train MARTA was built going back into the 70s there's only one pipe going north and south through Atlanta, Atlanta. there's only one pipe going east and west through Atlanta so if one day we were to build the train all the way to Dahlonega it would have to stop every time on the way down you know, because we only have that. So we have those constraints. When people talk about why can't MARTA be like C-TRAM, why can't MARTA be like the metro in Washington, D.C., because it wasn't originally designed that way. We have to take that constraint. Uh, we have to recognize that constraint, go forward, look at the needs that we have to, to move people and deploy the capital in the most efficient and effective way for Georgians. 
keep talking to get more questions. Oh, I'm Zoom sorry. Mets down the end there, right here. They'll quit asking questions. No. And quit talking. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> sorry. Not at all. Yes, um, Mr. Chair. I guess since I'm still trying to get my arms around the a recent proposal that I received, you know, that martyr. I think they're trying to um, ask for a referendum, I guess, for what, on the November uh, ballot? How would this sort of tie in with what the latest uh, plan that Marder has on the table? Uh, I, I'm not sure to which you're referring. The Senate Bill 313 and 330 didn't make it for crossover. So, I mean, unless they, they try to uh, uh, pin that to some House bill and, and, and do something of that sort, a general bill, can't pass out of the Senate. Now, I'm familiar yesterday with a bill that I believe Representative Gardner dropped for the Atlanta delegation that would allow Atlanta to move forward in, in some way to have up to uh, three quarters of a cent tax and do some things into the in, you know, in MARTA mm -hmm. um, and take that before the voters. Um, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. They, nobody's asked me about that. Haven't uh, you know? Wasn't given that legislation to review, but I. I Again, I think even if even if the city of Atlanta does that, I would respectfully uh, suggest that this regional option is, is a still viable because at this point, I don't know what Atlanta would do. Don't know what they could do. I know in Fulton County, one one penny raises about two hundred million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So a half a penny was going to raise a mil a hundred million dollars a year in the city of Atlanta. I'm not sure what that is. It may be forty to fifty million dollars a year. So there's only so much they could do, and and respectfully. I would say they have the same issue if they take something to their voters. They've decided what the solution is going to be, but but I'm unclear that they've talked to folks in the districts to find out where they're moving them. And if they're going to ask the folks to pay the money, um, I don't think it's fair to ask them, hey, trust us six or eight years, you know, trust us, we guessed right. I'd prefer to do this study committee, go talk to people, get some empirical data before I put my hand out, metaphorically speaking on behalf of, of the state I, I, and ask for money. So to answer your question directly, and, and I better take my uh, leave from the chairman, to, to answer it directly, what MARTA is doing is, is, uh, is, is a piece, but it is not a regional transit solution that, that mm -hmm. I think we need. Okay. Or I sh you should say what Atlanta's doing with MARTA. And lastly, Representative John Blackman on the yeah, I'm sure, but uh, just, just not that I'm against this, Chairman. I just was wondering: is there any particular reason why this is being done at a legislative level versus something that's more local-based, regional-based? Well, but because it, we did 170, you know, at the um, legislative level. I mean, it, if we were to implement a change, you know, or to a transit, you know, a regional transit system, it, it probably is going to have to be something that's going to be done through general law. Uh, so certainly, we would we would involve people, uh, all of those you know, local officials, mayors, you know, county commissioners from the counties that wish to be involved. Nobody's going to be, you know, made to be involved. But I, I think um, if, if you look at how 170, and that's how the 170 last year is set up, it has to be done at a county by county level. So the only way, if, if we want to make it truly regional, just say that, you know, Atlanta, DeKalb, Fulton, um, Cobb went out, and again, I, I hate to say that because as soon as I do that, somebody will go out here and print and say that, you know, I said those people needed to be in the transit system. I don't want to say that. But if those people decided they wanted to come together and be part of a regional transit system, it would probably take general law to do that. And I think it, it's a place where we could bring people together and facilitate a solution so it didn't get um, so tied up in, in local matters, you know, pulling at each other. We, we could be the arbiter, if you will, be a fair arbiter. Thank you, sir. Representative Dukes. One last question. One last observation, because I thought we did have a, uh, a mechanism put in place for regional, for a uh, regional solution for those counties, because I think they are all represented uh, on the MARTA board in some way. I think that Cobb is. is. Clayton mm -hmm. is. The Clayton, my, my understanding, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt there, but my understanding, the city of Atlanta, Fulton, the cab, and Clayton are represented on, on the board. Cobb and Gwinnett County are not part of the MARTA. They're, they're part of CCT. You know, Gwinnett has transit. There's, there's Greta. And I think the question is, can I, I mean, you, you'll go down Peachtree Street this afternoon, and you'll see three different buses, at least three different buses. You'll see a Greta bus, a CCT bus, and a MARTA bus, quite frankly, blocking Peachtree Street so people can't, can't use it. 
and it just seems like we, we can there, there's probably a better way to run that uh, railroad if you'll pardon the time. But I, I think I think legislation is place for them to be able to come in whenever they want to. I think Gwinnett can come in. Uh, all they have to do is agree to, I think, the penny, and I think the same thing exists in Cobb. So anybody who wants to come into the regional plan that exists, I think the mechanism is there. Well, the, yeah. certainly Clayton made themselves um, available of, of the mechanism, yeah. but we're, we're, it's not, and again, Mr. Chairman, I know you're ready to go. I thought I was going to be brief here, but it's not just a question of them, them joining MARTA. I mean, th this this study committee is not going to presuppose MARTA is, is the, answer to the regional transit solution. It, it may be Greta that, that, that takes over. I mean, I, I, I don't want to get with assumptions. When you make assumptions, you get in trouble. But I, don't, I just, this, this doesn't want to look, uh, to presuppose that, that one particular um, delivery for service is the right one. It wants to look at how things are being delivered and how they should best be delivered in the future. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, it's going to be a big look. Representative Dukes, that what goes on in transportation. I know my daughter and many millennials that want to live in Atlanta. Well, this will be very interesting to them. Thank yes, you, Chairman Thank Martin. you. Next up, Chairman Cooper, I'm so sorry that you've been standing over there. None of you gentlemen offered these two fine ladies a place to sit. And Mr. Rep <laughs> Chairman Cooper, would you please come? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> You're fine, Miss Darlene? Okay. Chuck's cell phone. Thank you for saving him. <laughs> Chairman Cooper, you've got a study committee looking at the Georgia Abuser Registry. Right, for the elderly and the disabled. If I can just give you a little bit of a background. Georgia is an aging society. You've probably heard me talk about that. We're aging four to one for elderly toward every one young person that's coming into the state. Uh, so we have a growing problem, not only with all our services and transportation and so forth, and you know, elderly, elderly people are one of the groups that want us to look at how they can move around as they no longer can drive, but especially because of a terrible abuse problem. Uh, as our group of elderly people grow, so does our abuse problem. And uh, you know we have a societal problem uh, because it's changed so drastically than when our grandparents. Uh, when my grandparents grew old, they, there was a large family. Aunts and uncles lived close by. They took care of them. They kept them in their home. Or if they got to where they couldn't live independently, they moved in with one of their children. We're now a very transient society, and we are a society of having one or two children. And so we may have parents that live on the East Coast, and we end up with our jobs on the West Coast. And so more and more elderly people are either aging with no family members, they out, either outlive their children, or their children live in a distance away from them. And, and as they age, they become very vulnerable. If you live to be 85, uh, you have a 50-50 chance of a developing Alzheimer's disease. And of course, that interferes with your cognitive ability to make good decisions for yourself. And we have more and more individuals being 85. We've also, uh, if elderly people, as we went through the 50s and 60s, um, because of our mobile society, people that were elderly ended up in nursing homes. And although lots of nursing homes had problems, at least they were in an institution, these were licensed facilities, and there was somebody checking on them and there was a way to report abuse or if a caretaker stole from you. It wasn't perfect, but now we're moving to the model of aging in place. And we are in, have a movement to move everybody, the disabled and the elderly, out of the nursing home facility and to their community and to have home health care. And so we have a new problem. We have a problem of who's going to take care of them in their home. How do you know who to hire? Uh, does that person that you hire to take care of your mother, as I did my mother in Tennessee four hours away, does that person have a criminal record? Is there a way as a responsible adult to, ch to check? And we don't have that in Georgia. So what this study committee would do would help us look at 
there's about 19 other programs across the United States, states that have enacted an elderly abuse registry. And it would give us an opportunity to look at what these states are doing. And we don't have to look far. Tennessee has an excellent registry. They have terrible elder abuse laws. They were looking at what we did when we talked to them and going, you got that passed? Wow, if we could do that for our elderly, that'd be a step forward. So even though they've had this registry where a family member can call up and say, I'm going you know, to hire this person and pull it up, and you can check to see if that person has been adjudicated and you know, found guilty, served time, or at a certain point in the legal process, if they have even been charged with abuse, uh, neglect, or exploitation. So they have a really good program for us to look at, and that's what we would be looking at if we do this uh, study committee. Um, one of the things we look at is how a registry would accept complaints. Uh, would they only do it from institutions or and from home health care units, or would they let the public have access to it? What department would maintain the registry? Now, we just moved a bill through where we've taken a baby step because all certified nursing assistants are already listed under the state. They're licensed and you can go on if you run a nursing home. You can go on and you can look and see if the person you're hiring is a certified nursing assistant and if they are on that registry. And if you have a complaint, if you have a nursing home facility, you can turn them in. And what we've done with the bill that's now over in the Senate rules as of today we have expanded that to change with the times. It says, okay, it doesn't just apply to nursing home facilities, it also applies to home health care areas so that if you are an agency and you're putting people out into people's homes, you can now access that registry. If you have a complaint, if we get this passed, the governor signs it, then you can turn that complaint into this registry and they will decide whether what to do with the investigation and the complaint rises to the level of an investigation. So hopefully that is one step. But if we're going to go further, we need to look at whether that's the place to house it or should it be housed with DHS where they already have the child abuser registry. Maybe that would be the most economical way to do it. That's in another department. So also, are we only going to put people on the registry that have been found guilty of offenses, or are we going to do like Tennessee, and when they've reached a certain point in the legal process, allow that to be put on the registry <coughs> as a possibility? So we would have to look at that, and if you're going to do that, there certainly has to be a place for individuals to go and make an appeal before that goes out. You've made a mistake. Somebody else has the same name that I do. That's not me. Uh, or to least do it, and where would you do that? Would that be uh, the state, our Office of State Administrative Hearings? Who would do that? Uh, so we don't want to have a registry that you know puts people unnecessarily on a list that says don't hire these people. But we are putting with people to take care of our most vulnerable ci citizens because the elderly often become just like our children. And so it's sort of like on the beginning life of life and the ending of life, where certain individuals do need that kind of care, and we need to have the best and people who are not using and taking care of them. So these are the kind of things that we would be looking at in the study committee. Um, I know this is just a hearing, but part of the education is just letting people know that elder abuse is a problem in our state. Um, it's really like child abuse was in the 50s and the 60s. And people would see people practically beating their child, calling it a spanking, and they would say, oh, that, that's just a parent disciplining their child. And now we know that when you come up with bruises and hand marks on you that stay for a week, a week at a time, that's not discipline, that's abuse. And over that time period from the 50s and 60s, we changed our laws. And so, Elder abuse and the laws we have are back in those days, and we are slowly here in Georgia changing them and across Georgia, like in Cobb County, and I, I'm proud of my county. It's not a county office. It's a group of volunteers that have joined together to do the Cobb Elderly Task Force, 
and they have brought together bankers, uh, social workers, people from the sheriffs and the, and the police, and all aspects, uh, people from the Georgia Council on Aging, to work together on elder abuse. And unfortunately, I have to tell you that so often we have also have a nation of very self-centered people and children who look upon their parents and what they have worked for all their lives is their inheritance, not what should be able to take care of their parents in their old age. And often, it's the people, or an elderly person's own children that abuse them or financially take advantage of them. And it is a sad state that we have to say about uh, the state of our society when we have that and it's so rampant. And the other problem is drugs. Um, often a grandchild or a family member who's abusing drugs will often go to a grandparent and you know help drain them and tell them sad stories and so forth and drain their parents. So um, I applaud our Georgia Council on Aging. I applaud the Cobb Elder Abuse Task Force and our sheriff and especially our Marietta Sheriffs, don't do anything to anybody elderly in the city of Marietta because I'm telling you, Sheriff Flynn will be on your back. And uh, I'm very proud of what he's done. And that, in essence, is what the study committee would do, and I appreciate the committee giving me a chance to talk to you. Well, I think, committee members, you've, uh, if you're not on health uh, with me, you don't uh, just appreciate the passion that Chairman Cooper has for people. And um, I sure do. And after your talk there, I think you made it very clear. We have a few questions, Madam Chairman. Sure. I think the first one is Representative Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman, for, for bringing the study committee. I mean this as a compliment. You sound very knowledgeable about this process already, and <clears throat> you, you've brought a lot of information. You didn't use notes just off the top of your head. You seem extraordinarily knowledgeable about this. And, and so my question is, um, because of that, is, is do you really think there's a lot of value in having a study committee as opposed to going with what you already know? Well, I... I think there's value, and I will tell you, I know a lot about it, and I am elderly. <laughs> so uh, part of this is, in a, no, seriously, I dealt with it with my mother. Um, even though the group of women that were recommended by the physician in the small town, and he had worked with them for several years, my mother was taken for $5,000 before I could get power, uh, well, power of attorney, and then uh, become her official caretaker, what's it called, legally. Uh, Guardian. conservator for my mother, uh, which took several weeks in the legal process in this small town. Uh, drove her through. My mother never went through the drive through just banked at the same bank, never cashed a check over $1,000, and the caretaker drove her through uh, the forest part uh, drive through at the bank, asked for a cashier's check. And my mother was in the car, but she was like five feet tall. Unfortunately, I looked like my dad. And uh, could have been holding a gun to her, and the teller said, and Miss Anderson, is that, you know, and my mother said, yes, and they gave her uh, $5,000 in cash. For my mother, that wasn't going to make or break what she lived on, uh, because my mother had been very careful and saved my money and her money since my dad died, and we used almost every bit on it because she wanted to stay home, but for many people, $5,000 would have been all they had between destitute and savings. And so not only am I elderly and looking at this, I have personal experience with it. Yeah. And you know, I, when I went to the bank in Tennessee and said, look what's happened. Oh, we know, it's really terrible. We have grandchildren bringing their grandmothers in all the time. And, we've, and I said, look, in Georgia, we have laws. You can refuse to do that. In fact, when I went to my banker here and asked about it, my banker said they'd rather have a pissed off customer than a customer with no money. And that's Kessel Stelling, who runs Synovia now and all. And, but up in Tennessee, they were saying they couldn't do it. And so, uh, like I said, I've had lots of personal experience. Uh, the thing we're going to do, if we come to you saying we're going to start and make this a law, and we would have to make it a law to start this registry, we need to have dot all our I's and cross all our T's because we're going to be talking about people with records and making that probably having the public have access to it. So we're going to make want to sure that nobody goes on there that shouldn't be. We want to make sure that we put it in a place in the state that is the most economical place, to put it, that's going to cost the state the least amount of money and that we're not duplicating services. And that's why I said if we're going to do it, maybe the place to do it is they already have the child abuse registry set up. Maybe it wouldn't cost that much more 
to have them just do the elder abuse because they're already set up to do a registry. I don't know. And that's why, because it involves so many areas of the law, the state, I think we really need to look at it really carefully, what we want to cover, whether we want to start off small in the beginning, like covering only people that have been found guilty, and then maybe later doing what Tennessee does. I don't know, so I think that's why it needs it. But, but thank you for that question. Representative Spencer. Oops, sorry. Yeah, you mentioned you that the Tennessee Registry um, puts them on if they're convicted or with some kind of crime or misdemeanor or whatever. Then you said there, there was also another criteria, a legal point. What legal point is Tennessee using to put them on other than a conviction? You've got me. May I ask Mr. Chairman Kathy if she remembers what the technical term okay. is? I'm not a lawyer, Representative Spencer. Okay. Absolutely, ma'am. Thank you. I think that sort of answers your question, Representative Turner. There's a lot to dig into here, isn't there? And Representative Scott. Thank you, um, Chair, Chairman, um, for, for, this, for this, because every week or every other month, we see elderly abuse going on in the state of Georgia. And we all have someone that is elderly, probably in our family. And if we don't have anyone to take care of them, they could be subjected to the same type of abuse. And I'm glad that you're bringing this legislation forward. But I would also would like to see that um, some kind of way we can throw in cameras. Um, we know that elderly abuse is on the rise, not only in your own, in the homes, but also in the, in the nursing homes. So I just think there's so many avenues and so many things that we need to look at when we're talking about the elderly. Because these are people that have worked all their lives. They have done the best, and now they're at this point. They don't have any family or someone a lot of times to come in and check on them. And they are just left there. They're abused. They're mistreated. And we really need to uh, look at cameras in our nurses' facilities also. So. I would like to see that um, something like that also come on board to have cameras in the nursing home so that we could keep an eye on our elderly because there's still someone, mother or father. Thank you, Representative. I, it, it is a problem, and we are using technical uh, devices more and more in all sorts of areas, so I think it is something uh, to look at. And I will tell you that abuse comes from the poorest people who have only their uh, Social Security or the check they get even if they didn't work all their life until the millionaires. We just had somebody, a lady in Cobb County, who owned the, her family owned the hardwood store and all of the land as you cross the Chattahoochee going up Johnson's Ferry Road and people took her for like six million dollars. She was 93 years old. And I mean they did catch the people, they got part of it back and that money had been accumulating for selling all the stuff and all the business that go up Johnson's Ferry but they took her for everything. Uh, cleaned out her account. So, I mean, it's from the poorest of poor to the richest of the rich. Everybody's vulnerable. Well, Chairman Cooper, I think you've got a volunteer. Uh, Representative this Scott here just going to be on your bandwagon okay. for sure. But we sure appreciate hearing from you on this very important thank issue. You very thank, you thank you very much. Thank you very much, committee. And I want to thank all the committee members because over the last few years, you've helped and voted for a lot of bills that have helped uh, reduce elder, uh, elder abuse, and I appreciate for all those votes in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Taylor. This is one that affects us all, I believe, isn't it? And you're very knowledgeable about it. We look forward to hearing from you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today uh, I bring me, you Pop House Resolution. Yeah, go ahead. Tell them the number. I didn't say that. Thir um, 1367. Yes, ma'am. House Resolution 1367. This is an issue that I've been concerned about for a while. It has to do with the prescription drug. Everybody's heard the uh, PBMs, PBMs. They're the run that run all of our prescription drug programs, and they are by their name, pharmacy benefit managers. But there seems to be a cloak of secrecy. Nobody can seem to get behind it to see where the money's going. And I've asked for audits and looks, and let's, let's find out what's going, uh, what's going on behind the scene. It does affect all of us. It affects us as representatives. It affects us how we uh, allocate money from the state. But it's a big issue that faces everyone in the state because most people belong to a health care plan and it's tied into one of these programs. What I'm asking the committee to do is allow us to have a study program to go behind the curtain. We want to actually have folks from PBMs come, explain to us as legislators how they work, how they do their billing, how they do their pricing, and be able to analyze it for ourselves and see how they're actually working. And where are our hard-earned dollars? The taxes that we are paying for health insurance for state employees and for Medicaid are hard-earned by the people of this state. And I think we need to and have a responsibility to be good stewards of that money. And I think this will give us the opportunity to look at those costs, to follow them through the whole process of when a prescription is written, when it's filled, who pays for it, and where are those dollars going, and how was it priced? Um, I'm not asking for a big committee. Only five folks are all I think we need. Um, I would like it to culminate at the end. Um, this year, the commissioner has agreed to have an audit of the state's plan. And I'm very glad that he is, and I think it would be wonderful if we had our previous four meetings learning and hearing from public PBMs, hearing from those that do audits of PBMs, from folks that are using programs, and, and learn from all aspects of it and culminate with that audit report from the commissioner. Representative Taylor, just one, you know, I first read this from the other day. When we do something like this, I mean, will you be, I know there's trade secrets and business secrets mm -hmm. that people use to develop plans, how they price and how they utilize and profit. So you've right. got to have that. I mean, how does it, um, you know, I guess that's part of the thing is how does it protect those? I mean, well, there, I think that's there are many things, but sometimes there can be a discretion used in what you're calling a trade secret and what someone else is. When you're talking about the dollars, and the formularies and how much you're receiving on the back end, I think you've crossed over from a trade secret to a financial exchange that's affecting us as state payers. And I think we need to look at that. This is not something we're going to you know, broadcast. I'm not asking for their secret formula, but I am asking for where the money's going, what are you paying for it, and what are we paying for it, and what is an employee paying for it, and seeing how it adds up. Because from looking from the mile high, it doesn't add up, and I think we need to take a closer look at it. And I don't expect to have any trade secrets out there bestowed upon the public. Thank you, ma'am. Representative Spencer has a question for you. Well, I have a specific question. When you say they don't add up, can you give me an example of what you're talking about? Yeah, when you have um, AWP, mm -hmm. it's the average wholesale price, and they say that you have um, today the average wholesale price for a particular drug is this amount. It's on a sliding scale. And I've seen reports from the same PBM for the same drug, two different places, two different AP, APA. They're reporting the same. When you say places, you mean pharmacies? Yes. Okay. Pharmacies are being billed differently and be reimbursed. But they're even indicating the, AP, the average wholesale price on one day for one person is one thing, and over here, the same day, the same drug, a different price. That's what I'm talking about. And you're talking about the time frame is very close to each other, or are you oh, talking the about same day. the same day? The yeah. same day. That's what I'm saying. So there's some discrepancy, and should the average wholesale price be the same for one, um, one particular PBM as it is for another? It's still the same price, mm -hmm. but even within the same PBM, it had two different prices. Yeah, I would say that would stir some okay. amused questions. Anyone else on the committee have a question for Representative Taylor? I hear none. Thank you, Representative Thank Taylor. You, Your passion, it. you got this down. You know it, don't you? Let me see. I think
that one. Next, we'll have Representative Caldwell. He's got House Resolution 1345. Looking at Georgia craft breweries and distillery competitiveness. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Y'all forgot to save the best for last. You're just stuck with me, so we'll try. Oh, we have one more. We've got. <laughs> oh, okay, Ms. good. Rake you did save the here. best for last. We, uh, we, All right. save, we save the best for last. <laughs> <Our committee members. laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I bring to you House Resolution 1345. Uh, just for safety's sake, I'm working off of LC 362963. Um, I'm bringing you a bit of an anomaly today. Uh, I have a study committee resolution with 91 House members co-sponsoring. So I'm actually going to show it off because it's probably the last time I'll ever have something that we can get a majority of the <laughs> House to co-sponsor. Um, I will drop the note that uh, 14 of the 22 members of the Special Rules Committee are co-sponsoring this resolution. So to those of you who are co-sponsoring with me, thank you. Um, to those of you who aren't, I want to tell you a little bit about what it is, and uh, maybe you'll jump down to the clerk's office and join me on this ride. Um, talk to you a little bit about the problem that we're looking to go study and fix here, and I'm going to be really brief because I recognize it's gap day and I'm between you guys and your cars probably. So <laughs> um, we are one of two, two states in the union that uh, does not allow breweries to sell beer out of the brewery. Um, aside from that, breweries on average in this state are two and a half times less profitable than breweries in sister states. Uh, if you take sister states with similar drinking age population and compare out, on average we should have about 14,000 direct microbrewery jobs in this state. We have 1,300. Um, that's a delta of 12,700 for those who don't want to do the math. I took the calculator out and checked it, so you can trust me. Um, we, we're clearly missing something here. Now, the reason I want to do a study committee here, I hope that with each of you, as I've gotten to know you, I have developed a reputation being data-driven. I want to make sure that when we go about this, we do it the right way, the smart way. Um, we have a three-tiered system in this state. We are not unique in that. The majority of states have a three-tiered system. Um, to me, the problem is likely not the three-tier system, considering the majority of states have them, and yet they seem to have fixed these problems. In the last two years, you've had uh, large-scale reforms happening with these laws in both South Carolina and Alabama, both sister states. Every state that borders us uh, allows for beer to be sold out of breweries, but, but also has differing, differing laws, depending on which facet of this law we're looking at. So rather than jumping in and diving in with a large-scale reform package, I want to make sure that we study this and do this smart. Um, the beauty with this issue when 48 other states have jumped into this first, uh, we have the opportunity to go look at what has worked and what hasn't worked. So um, this is, to me, the very definition of what a study committee is for, is to make sure that we go look at what other states are doing, study sister states. And so if you read the language of the, of the resolution, what I'm actually asking for is a study committee not necessarily to study beer law in general or study distillery law in general, but to study what sister states have done to become more competitive. Um, to break those numbers down for you one more time, that 12,700 jobs that we're missing out on re represents roughly a third of a percentage point of the unemployment rate in this state. So if we were to get this right, and we do it right the first time, then we could do this all in one bill. We could set it up so that we could actually shave our unemployment rate down from 5.6 to 5.3 percent. Now, if every single study committee that came before you offered a third of a percentage point off the unemployment rate, I bet we'd all get a lot more excited about study committees. So, <laughs> so. My, my ask to the committee um, would be uh, understanding it, it will not happen today, but would be that you would uh, eventually look favorably on the idea of setting up a uh, committee of five members to go study this issue, uh, see how we attack it in a way that makes sense, preserves the integrity of the three-tier system, preserves and protects all of the retailers, the distributors, and the brewers um, and distillers so that we make sure that we're, we're protecting all of our business owners in this state, incentivizing business growth in one of the fastest growing industries in the country. And I did that without notes. So, <laughs> so um, be happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Uh, again, this is something I, I get awfully passionate about, but um, I think it's, it's something that could really benefit some small business owners in this state uh, and incentivize more to come from around the country. We're the number one state to do business unless this happens to be your business, in which case we're trailing. So let's figure out how we make every industry number one. Thank you, Representative Caldwell. I'll just start off with one. We've got the number of flashing lights here, oh. but have – there have been discussions, I mean, um, I know this is kind of like a silo business, sure. between um, craft brewers and those in the distributor thing, and, and identified barriers sure. that are out there that... A absolutely, and it's part of what's interesting about this issue, right, is when you, uh, when you talk to distributors, you talk to the retailers, you talk to the brewers, you talk to the distillers, you get, you get 
different angles and different perspectives. Um, and it's interesting too. Uh, a lot of you know I travel for a living. I was on 142 planes last year, so I get the I get the added benefit of not just talking to brewers and distillers and distributors in this state, but I go talk to them in other states too because I'm the nerd who continues to study policy even when I'm not down here. Um, so I go sit around the country talking to these people too, and it's interesting to see how different the perspectives in are, are in surrounding states too, where where the laws are different. Um, that's part of why I think this is so important. Is yes, those conversations happen. Um, I, as far as I know, sometimes agreements are found, sometimes they're not. It's why I think as legislators, it's important that we sort of step out, take a fresh perspective on this, sit down, have everybody come to the table. Let's have a conversation. Let's, let's just study this in a real official fashion, as opposed to the, um, uh, chicken with a head cut off route that so often we as legislators take. I know I do it often where I just kind of run around and talk to everybody. I'd really like to, you know, let's, let's add some formality to this, really study the issue, get to know it well and make sure that before we do anything, we're doing it um, with a wise approach. And you were also nice, you didn't mention the, uh, I think you sent me an email and some others on what happened in Athens this past weekend. Yeah, um, and that's a, it's a, another very interesting point. You have municipalities now talking about um, whether or not to cite breweries based on where their local, ish, their local ordinances and our state laws conflict. And, um, and so we're running into really interesting governmental local control issues along with whether or not our laws make any sense compared to sister states. Um, I'm sure there are some things we're getting right that sister states have gotten wrong, and that's why I think it's so important that we study this before we, we jump in with, uh, with an actual legal change. So thank you for that. I think that's an important point. Thank you, Representative. Uh, we have a question from the committee. Representative Rakestraw, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So. I just wanted to make a comment um, that I think um, that this is definitely much needed because of surrounding states doing this. Um, I have a constituent that actually has a, a brewery that's doing really well near the Alabama state line, and he said that you know he could move it over the line and make a lot more money and be a lot more competitive. And you know, me being the the job lover that I am, you know, I think we need to do everything to keep those jobs and those opportunities in our state and you know and so I I very much support this but I think we also need to look at you know of what we can do to be competitive with surrounding states so that they don't go across state lines with their their viable businesses thank so, you for that Madam Vice Chairman I'll tell you I know more than one Georgian who owns breweries outside of this state and it's it's for exactly that reason um, and I know of several breweries who are being courted to leave the state and that's a that's a whole new different question that uh, that spooks me so thank you Representative Dominic Lurica chairman uh, I'm one of the representatives up here that has probably developed a little bit of a reputation to be in very, very, very cautious and concerned about access uh, to alcohol uh, by people under age and people of age. Uh, the numbers on what alcohol does to communities and society are absolutely rock solid. And uh, it's hard for me to hear somebody uh, brag about us being the number one state in the nation to do business and use the mathematics of the fact that we're only one of two states in the nation that does not do this. That doesn't, those two don't go together. Perhaps uh, we're the number one state in the nation to do businesses because we don't follow the example of the other 48. I am glad that you're doing this through a study committee type of a, a pathway because I think you'll be able to hear some of maybe what would be my side of the, the right. stories. And uh, But no, I, I certainly respect you and trust your leadership in this, but I just wanted to kind of get that on the record. No, thank you for that, Representative. And I think, I, I, thank you. I think you drove home the point that I was going to make at the end there, and that's it. Um, plainly, you may very well be right. I'm, I may have the issue totally upside down in my head, and we may be, uh, we may want to stick to it and run with it and then go start talking sister states into the sense of it. The only way we find that out is through a study committee. So um, I want to make sure we study this, understand uh, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and that there's logic behind what we're doing, not just the, not just tradition behind it. Thank you. Next will be Representative Jason Spencer. I just more of a comment, Mr. Chairman. Um, about three years ago, I put in a bill that uh, for the first time in Georgia legalized homebrew competition. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you for that. And the reason for that is because I recognize uh, what significant economic impact that this industry would put on the state of Georgia. And many of these craft brewers get their start as home brewers. Mm -hmm. 
And so I recognize that and that it was a uh, significant change, one of the significant changes in our, uh, our beer laws and our alcohol laws. Um, I have many constituents who homebrew in uh, Camden County, which borders uh, Florida. Um, they go over across the line. Uh, they participate in these competitions. They participate mm -hmm. in the craft brew uh, industry uh, across the state lines. And this is economic activity uh, that we are losing, and I appreciate your uh, bringing this bill, and I hope we can get to the bottom of this and, and free the beer. Thank you. Thank you for that, Representative. And that's, that's a point that I think is important to make is, is craft beer is coming into Georgia. This likely doesn't in increase or decrease the amount of beer consumed in Georgia. The question is whether or not we want to actually take part in the economic activity that goes along with making it. And I think it's important to, and the answer may be yes or no, I think it's important to study. Anyone else? Yep, here's one popped up. Number nine right here. Go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you as well for you bringing this study committee uh, from someone who is not a beer drinker but understanding the commerce and the business opportunity and just understanding that um, we could create another viable business with some responsibility mm -hmm. attached to it. So um, I'm encouraged and just wanted to tell you thank you. Thank you. Uh, for that. And a lot of people that I know that do enjoy a good brew or whatever y'all call beer, uh, <laughs> appreciate that as, uh, as well. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Representative. No other questions from the committee? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate, appreciate your passion. It. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And lastly, we have Representative Rake Straw, and she's going to go up front there. And this is a, looking at electronic cigarettes, e liquids, and other vapor products. It's uh, something we've seen all on signs across our communities that say vape. Is that not right? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So what I have before you, there's actually a substitute to this bill, and I don't think y'all have a copy of it. And um, so I They do have a copy. The this was handed out. Benign, but um, I can go over those. But So basically, um, when we started out the session, um, there I was approached about, you know, doing something to regulate the, the vape industry because um, there's no regulation, there's nothing in the code that says they can't sell to minors, e-liquids aren't defined in the code, and we needed to, you know, bring some kind of regulation around this consumable so that consumers know what they're getting and it's relatively safe. And so in drafting it, there was really nowhere that this fit in the code. So we started out with a bill that, um, uh, House Bill 907, and we put it out there just to get the process started and the discussion started, but you know, we felt like it greatly overregulated an industry that we wanna protect and to make sure is viable. And, and because there are so many issues that are really stemming from the industry, we didn't feel like we had adequate time to really do it justice because we don't wanna harm the vape industry. You know, we, we love that business and it's um, you know, booming and emerging, but we also wanna make sure that we're protecting consumers, that they that they get, they know what they're getting, that it's in a, a sealed and labeled packaging, and a lot of these places are self-regulating, but some of them are also mixing, and and so they're basically the the manufacturing, the distribution, and the point of sale all in one location, and they don't really know what they're getting. But we've been trying to figure out: does this fit in the Department of Pharmacy? Does it fit under Ag? because it's not a food product, but it's not really a drug either. Um, and some of the vape has nicotine in it, some of it doesn't. But there are issues that I think we need to study as a state. Um, like, I've been told that um, that there was a, a chemical that um, was made, it's called popcorn lung, when they made, in the factories, when they made um, microwave popcorn, that the employees were ingesting a chemical that was causing their lungs to swell. And I've been told, and I don't, it's not verified, but I don't, that some of the, the vape stuff has that in it. Um, I have a friend that approached me and said that there's a rehab full of people that are getting a, a product called Kratom from these things. And, and that is in labeled and sealed product, uh, packaging, but it's legal to sell this. And it's an opiate that's supposedly more highly addictive than heroin. And we've got rehabs full of people that, that have gotten this from our vape shops. And so I think we need to look at issues like that. But I want to bring 
all the people in the industry to the table to talk about how we can have a minimum amount of regulation on this industry so that consumers are protected and know what they're getting without harming the business model and harming the industry because I'm very pro-business and you know I want to protect our businesses in Georgia. I just also want to make sure that we're doing it in a safe way. So that's the reason for the study committee and if you want to look at the changes in the substitute, I guess y'all have a, a substitute. Um, lines five through eight in the original has been replaced with five through nine. Um, so that's been stricken and that's been inserted in. And then on line 13, um, instead of the word prohibiting, we use the word restricting. And on, on line 14, um, instead of childproof caps, um, child resistant caps and then there was one change that they didn't pick up um, on line 27 um, it says uh, consumers from the use of it should say known harmful products period and strike the rest of that sentence so those are the um, proposed changes and that's the goal of this study committee is to just look at how we can um, we can do that and bring everybody to the table and you know make sure that we're not selling illegal drugs or harmful chemicals out of these vape shops and that it's you know at a minimum labeled and and consumers know what they're getting and that there's something in the code that says you can't sell it to under 18 year olds and the code doesn't say anything about an e-liquid or define these products in any way so I'll take questions thank you representative I so we've been reading the paper and I know that the um, FDA is looking at these in general yes and so what's their posture if right now are they are, I think they're coming out with some regulations mm -hmm. would it address many of your I mean I guess you can't be a mind reader know what they're coming out with well we were told in the committee testimony that that they were close to passing something but then I had a conference call with you know the people in the industry and I mean I think they've been working on it for about five years but they can't really um, there's nothing that um, that's about the labeling and packaging and so they're a long way from reaching an agreement on that and so you know I think we should do something to put something in place because who knows when that'll come come down and and you know if we need to later on replace it with something that they pass you know we could but I think we need to do something to start the process of minimum regulations at this point because this stuff is being sold every day out of our vape shops and you know people are landing in rehab and you know it may or may not be causing health issues uh, I think it's really good though because I know a lot of people that have turned to vaping instead of smoking and that's got to be healthier so it and if it helps them you know get off of smoking because like I said you can buy the product with or without nicotine and you know vaping has become very popular so you know if it's helping people get off of cigarettes I think that's a great thing um, some in the industry said that we're also not regulating the e-cigarettes which is you know there's open systems and there are closed systems so the e-cigarettes are closed systems where you know they're manufactured and, and labeled and sent to the stores and you can't um, add anything to it so so the vaping and the e-liquids is, is for an open system where you can add to this contraption that you know heats it up and turns it into vapor so. who, would, who would be the regulator who is the enforcer I think that'd be a <laughs> question the committee would want to know who's well right now it's no one that's kind of part well. of the problem because we're trying to figure out where does this fit in the Department of Ag the Department of Pharmacy um, the, the sheriff's departments don't really have a way to regulate anything that's going on because there is nothing in the code that says you can or cannot sell this or you can't sell to minors you know that's, but what I, I have visited a couple of vape shops and what I found that a lot of them are self-regulating, which is good, but you know you probably have some out there that aren't. So I just think we need to kind of get a little bit of a handle on it. Who would you envision? I know it's just kind of a picky question, but who would be a regulator? I mean, whose house would this fall under to be the one that would go out? That's my curiosity. Well, it's it's kind of a 
sticky, tricky little thing because, like I said, it's not a food product, so it doesn't really fit the Department of Ag, but it's not a drug either. So it doesn't really fit the Department of Pharmacy, so it's sort of this hybrid thing that we need to define and create, you know, something around it that really defines it and puts some kind of process around it. I think that's all I have. Representative Spencer, do you have a... Um, in that same vein, when you regulate something like this, and who would be that regulator or the enforcer, um, are you proposing or looking at a vape tax? And then would that fall under the Department of Revenue as a regulator at that point? Um, I mean, that, I mean, that question's been asked. I'm, I'm not for, you know, huge taxes. So, you know, I mean, I think the committee needs to look at, you know, all pieces of this. Mm -hmm. I guess if it's got to be regulated, I mean, they've talked about, you know, licensing versus um, versus um, permitting, you know, um, and and having, you know, a process where they come and test product and, you know, regulate it to that degree. Because there's so many different mixes and formulas, I mean, even that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. Or because this stuff is mixed on site, you know, that's hard to do. But you know, the, the bottom line is it is being ingested by humans and, you know, we've got to have some way. So, I mean, there's just so many little issues where it doesn't really fit a standard mold or model for, for regulating and looking at, you know, what we're, what we're putting out there. I have one more question, if you don't Yes, sir, please go ahead. Are you aware of any product or civil liability that's been brought against the industry that you're aware of that has um, resulted in... You know, I have I have heard stuff about the popcorn lung, but I don't mm -hmm. know that there's been any um, lawsuits filed, and so I think those are the things we need to really look into. You know, in this study committee, is you know, is it harmful? I mean, it's fairly new, so uh, you know, the health impacts or repercussions probably won't happen till you know down the road when it's been out there a while. But I think if um, you know if it's helping people get off of smoking, it can't be all bad, but you know, hopefully what they're ingesting in replace of, you know, the nicotine and the, the harmful things in cigarettes, you know, is helping them from a health standpoint rather than harming it. Thank you. Representative Waits. Hey, I just want to thank you. I appreciate the uh, legislation. I, from dining here in the metro Atlanta area, they're actually giving out the packaging. So the marketing for these products are overwhelming. And I'm, I'm very much interested to see, you know, what the study committee comes up with in terms of, because the packaging, they have no indication of what the ingredients are and so forth. And I'm finding this to be very appealing to young people. And so I'm particularly very interested in serving on this committee if it should move forward. And I thank you. Question, uh, the hookah, is that also included in this conversation? I think the hookah, I think, um, I don't really smoke this stuff. Maybe y'all can answer this, but I think it's, um, you say other vapor. I, think I think it's think just another delivery mm -hmm. device, but it's, it is an open system mm -hmm. that you put oils and vapors into. The other thing they're selling in these shops is CBD <laughs> oil, and they're saying that it's, it doesn't have THC in it, yet it helps things like anxiety, and so I don't think we really know what's in it that helps those things, and if it's, you know, if it's helping that and and it's not addictive and, you know, I think that's fine, but I think we, we might want to look at that as well. Um, but apparently it's legal to sell the, the kratom and the CBD oil currently in Georgia. Thank you, Representative Brakestraw. We've got some great issues in Georgia, it looks like. Yeah, thank, thank you for your we're time. Done. The um, committee, here's what's going to go on. Next Wednesday, you know, we're, we're go until we'll, we'll meet next Wednesday and um, I'll make sure all of y'all have a bottle of water at your desk because at that moment we will move a bunch of bills to the floor we're in the process of um, scoring them rating them you know because you, know, you know our as we talked in our first meeting we are reducing the number of study committees that are out there this year and so you'll see a number of them and number of the bills or even uh, Madam Chairman Cooper's bill will probably be done as a chairman's committee. She'll do it herself. And there'll be a number of others, though, but there's some we won't. We'll, and so, but just be prepared for next Wednesday afternoon. Uh, and probably, I don't know what, you know, the rules counter is going to look like. 
Yeah, but we might change the time to even come a little earlier if, if we looks like maybe upon adjournment or something so we can get you all out of here that need got a long way to go. Right, Mr. Dominic? That's right. That's right. But I appreciate y'all's attention, and I think um, we're learning a lot, seeing a lot of different things in our, in our state. And I really want to thank our legislative council, you know, for being here with us and Mr. Williams and Mrs. Brooks for looking after y'all. And thank you very much. That's it. <laughs>